He has been married to his wife, Sandra, for a little over 20 years, which is quite an accomplishment. So um, thank you, Dr. Barker, for being with us today. We also have Dr. Dr. Brian Weaver, who coincidentally is um, recently married to his uh, uh, beautiful bride, Dr. Leslie Wagner Weaver. And uh, so we want to congratulate them on, on that accomplishment as we're talking about marriages today. But Dr. Weaver is originally from Texas Hill, Hill Country, about an hour northwest of San Antonio near Kerrville in Fredericksburg. Dr. Weaver attended Texas A&M for both undergrad as well as veterinary school, graduating from veterinary school in 2015. He then did a one-year internship at Alvarado Veterinary Clinic in Alvarado, Texas, just south of Fort Worth. He then spent two years here in Northeast Oklahoma as a mixed animal associate before joining us at Oklahoma State University uh, to pursue a residency. Dr. Weaver joined uh, the livestock services team following that residency here at OSU. He uh, moved uh, just a bit north in August 2020 to Kansas State University, and he currently rotates between livestock field services as well as livestock medicine and surgery as far as in clinic, in clinic duties. His uh, particular interest is in herd health, reproduction, obstetrics, neonatology, lameness, and musculoskeletal disease, anesthesia surgery, and pain management in, in production medicine. So uh, I think we're pretty fortunate to have uh, veterinarians of this caliber that have joined us today and, and really excited, excited to uh, hear the discussion. And uh, it looks like we have... Uh, we have some, maybe some Aggie fans in the group, uh, <laughs> Dr. Weaver. So with that, I'll have you bring up your presentation. And I'll go ahead and feel, feel free to get started. And uh, Dr. Barker and I'll just kind of jump in as, as you direct us um, or as a uh, we, as it makes sense uh, for the slide. Yeah, please do. Please jump in as we go. So um, kind of per Dr. Biggs recommendation, we're going to be talking about high risk, high value health today um, and just a continuation of the show cattle fundamentals um, kind of series that y'all have been putting on recently. So um, as she said, I am currently at Kansas State. Uh, my wife Leslie and I both work here in the livestock section. We actually share an office, uh, and she's here working with me today. Um, but we uh, there'll be a lot of purple in this presentation. Although I still am very uh, loyal to Oklahoma State, still have my Oklahoma State ca uh, coffee mug, and uh, obviously a diehard Aggie. So a uh, lot of lot of different loyalties there. But today we'll talk a little bit about vaccination protocols as they apply to our show cattle. I'll just briefly touch on some parasite control issues, um, some treatment protocols uh, that with special nuances um, relevant to uh, show calves, um, residue avoidance, and the, the special circumstances we have to pay attention to there, and then some common disease conditions and what to look for uh, as an exhibitor or as a as a parent of an exhibitor uh, to keep these animals healthy. So just to start off, this is uh, the material that I'm going to be presenting today is only for your general information and should not in any way replace a re relationship with a veterinarian. Um, and if any of the products that I show today are not an endorsement of that product. Um, some of them are things that I uh, am comfortable and, and use, but doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's uh, better than anything else out there. Um, it's just an example of what, what different products I might be talking about. So, so what are high risk calves in general? That term when used in the cattle industry is usually applied to commercial calves that are leaving the cow calf segment of the industry and entering the next phase um, and usually destined eventually for slaughter. Um, they are high risk because of their weaning status. Usually they have not been weaned uh, prior to being uh, shipped from the, the farm of origin. Um, they, their nutritional status, typically uh, they may not be used to eating a, um, a feed ration um, or know how to forage appropriately on um, pasture that they're going to be 
than moving to. Um, and because of that and their age, they're usually typically younger calves. Um, they may be lighter weight and less resilient to withstand the, the changes that we're about to put them through. The reproductive status, uh, usually bulls have not been castrated uh, or we might be dealing with some, some uh, younger pregnancies in, in heifers uh, that may make them higher risk as they, as they move through the later stages. Um, regardless of all those other things, some of the very uh, typical defining traits of a high-risk calf is that they are immunologically naive, meaning they have not encountered many of the pathogens that they will soon encounter as they, as they move on to that next stage, um, either through vaccination or natural exposure. Um, many of these animals, because of the way that the uh, industry is segmented and where most cow-calf produ production takes place in this country versus where most stalker or feedlot production takes place, many of these calves have had to endure a long haul. Um, for several hours or sometimes multiple days. Um, and then there's been, there's often commingling of cattle from various sources uh, to put together a lot load that is uh, similar enough and large enough to, to meet or fit um, certain criteria uh, that those, those uh, next stages of production require. So Dr. Weaver, when, when it comes to our show cattle and how we're, we're, generally seeing those got a little little bit of difference right between yeah. the commercial industry but but certainly no less risk when it comes to to disease necessarily absolutely so not. talk to us a little bit about that and dr barker feel free to to jump in here on on some of the things you see with respect H how are we seeing these show calves uh, kind of fit into a high risk category do we do a good job of, of having calves uh, ready to go? Let's say if we're a show, you know, if we're a breeder uh, targeted at show cattle, um, are, are all of those set to go? Um, but also from the perspective, if I'm buying one, how do I, how do I keep that in mind uh, once I get them to the house? Absolutely. Great, great point. Um, a lot of these things, especially uh, here at the top, may not be things that we're as worried about in our uh, show cattle prospects, especially whenever we're going to, to farms and ranches and looking at um, animals that we're, we're hoping to turn into to show steers or show heifers. Um, but we absolutely do have to worry about these bottom <clears throat> three. These are um, very much a problem or can be a problem with our show animals still. So a, a high risk calf might look like this in a, in a feedlot or a, a stalker operation kind of a mixed bag of, of genetics um, commingled from various sources. Um, but all these animals in this show ring under the bright lights still uh, might have some of these factors at play. Uh, maybe they haven't been vaccinated appropriately um, and they had to travel across the country or at least the state to get to some of these big shows. Um, and then they've gone from a relatively cush life um, being a, a show calf to um, being commingled to, with all these animals from across the state, um, being exposed to things that they've never been exposed to before and put in a, a relatively stressful situation for them with lots of stimuli and noise and, and, and people and being put into a small area that, that they may not be used to. And so I think they're not our classic high risk calf, but absolutely they are, they are at a higher risk. Um, and kind of the other side of the risk equation is what do you lose if one of these animals gets sick or dies? Um, a typical commercial calf may not have a lot of individual value, but some of these animals, multiple thousands of dollars we're talking about, and the, the time, energy, um, effort that's been put into those animals, especially by these kids that usually are attached to these, these animals. So, Dr. Parker, what, what are the, obviously your, your breeder, um, you deal with show cattle on a, on a daily basis. Um, what are the things that, that the good breeders are doing uh, to make, make these calves successful? What should we be asking as a buyer uh, <clears throat> history-wise uh, as if I'm, buying a, if I'm buying a project for, for my daughter, what are the things I should be asking related to the things that Dr. Weavers mentioned? Uh, you know, probably the big difference in, in these operations versus a standard commercial operation is, as has already been mentioned, the value. 
so in their protocols, they will be a little more extensive to cover everything versus commercial where it may not be economically uh, beneficial for them to do that. Uh, these calves in general are going to have health protocols set up for initial vax with boosters and pretty highly immunized against your basics before they ever leave the farm. And that's, that's one thing I would stress to people is know what that vaccination protocol is when they pick those calves up to see, then talk to your veterinarian. And are there, are there any other things in our specific area or the areas we're going to travel into that we need to be abreast of to know and get them immunized for that as soon as you can on arrival so that you've had time to get those boosters and created the immunity that will be needed to offset, you know, development of the disease when exposed. Sounds great. Go ahead, Dr. Weaver. Thank you. So herd health programs in general, um, this is probably one of the most misunderstood understood terms in the industry, I feel. Um, most people uh, talk about their vaccination protocol and think that that is all encompassing of a herd health program, but there's obviously a lot of different factors. Um, I put nutrition at the top because I think if, if your nutrition is not in line, the rest of what we do is not going to matter one bit. Um, parasite control goes hand in hand with that, although we, we don't necessarily have the same uh, parasite issues that we do for our commercial herds, but certainly there are some issues to be aware of. Biosecurity, and this is a big one, especially with our, our show cattle um, that'll be traveling to potentially multiple shows over the course of the year and bringing home with them things that they pick up at that show. So um, making sure that we're only using our feed buckets and sanitizing our trailer and, and tack between shows um, is really, really important. Uh, keeping a, and maintaining a clean stall while we're there at the show and, and trying to make sure we don't get our cattle commingled with, with people outside of, outside of our kind of closer um, circle of, of uh, uh, friends and people that we, we typically interact with. Vaccination is obviously a big, big factor here, but um, certainly not at the top of the list either. Um, all these other things uh, matter a great deal, um, but just like Dr. Barker alluded to, uh, the cattle that we're dealing with, because of their value, we need to make sure that they, they are vaccinated and prepared to, to encounter those, those disease challenges that they're certainly going to face. Um, genetics and reproduction is probably less Im important from this, what we're going to be talking about today, but stress management, um, is, uh, is really a, a big thing, um, in trying to do everything that we can to, to prepare these animals before we, we put them on a, a trailer for a five hour trip. And, um, then they live in a show barn for, for a week, um, in a situation that they're just not, not used to. And then we'll talk a little bit about antibiotic use protocols and how they fit into a herd health, <coughs> herd health program. Uh, and we'll, we'll kind of cross that bridge when we get there. Any other comments before we move on? Um, so I'll touch briefly on a few different vaccines, just so people are, are introduced and aware of, of what's out there. Um, it can be be easy to get overwhelmed with the sheer number of uh, vaccine products that are on the market, um, but I find it makes it a lot easier to break it down into a few categories and then know what, what products from those categories are needed um, because you don't nece necessarily need to, to give uh, vaccines from multiple products from the same category. So the, the first and possibly one of the most important um, would be the, a clostridial vaccine. And most of our uh, attendees today are probably more familiar with this being known as a black leg vaccine. Um, there are a variety of products on the market and they're usually referred to as uh, seven, eight or nine way. Uh, those will be some other common terms associated with this vaccine. Um, and it covers seven, eight or nine different antigens or, or pathogens that we're trying to protect these cattle against. Um, black leg, again, being probably the most uh, commonly common disease affecting this age of cattle. Um, however, all of these can be big issues as well. Um, 
these all these clostridial organisms produce disease by producing a toxin, um, and these vaccines actually protect the animal against the toxin, not the infection. Um, and so you may hear other terms like toxoid or antitoxin, um, and just again, familiarizing you with terminology. Um, treatment for these diseases is often unrewarding. Um, however, we often don't even get a chance to treat most of these because by the time they're showing signs of disease, they very quickly die. Um, they Most of these animals affected present to a veterinarian as already dead. Um, so vaccine is extremely important. These are also very effective, very inexpensive vaccines. And there's an old adage that if you lose an animal to blackleg, you've probably, you could have bought your next 20 years worth of vaccine from the money you just lost um, due to that, that uh, death from blackleg. So um, there's no reason to not vaccinate these animals against blackleg uh, and is an extremely effective, very cost-effective vaccine. So Dr. Weaver, we ca I've heard this from uh, from exhibitors in the past and maybe Dr. Barker's got some hints too. You know, the some of these, uh, I'm not going to vaccinate because I don't want to create a, a blemish, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously we're trying to follow beef quality assurance really we need to make sure our youth exhibitors understand beef quality assurance guidelines and, and how that relates so talk to us about recommendations and, and Dr. Barker I'm going to throw this to you when we're dealing with vaccines how do we how do we balance that obviously we don't want to blemish when we enter the show ring but um, are we vaccinating, trying to get those in, in and early so that if we do have a reaction, we can deal with it? Do you have, do you have any helpful hints or guidance for us on those kind of um, things? Yes. Ob obviously, the number one is not to get a blemish or to prevent getting a blemish. And the best way to do that is be as aseptic as you can. And that's not necessarily scrubbing the calf down, but making sure you're very aseptic when you're going into that bottle. Never going to the bottle with a used needle, always a fresh needle going in to refill your syringe. Uh, change needles frequently. A sharp needle is less likely to carry a pathogen into the animal than a dull needle. Uh, so kind of our standard is always a fresh needle into the bottle to refill your syringe. And if you're doing a group, um, I would recommend changing needles about every five animals at a maximum. Um, when you're doing individual show calves, you're best to use a clean needle on each animal uh, just to reduce that. Obviously, if you get a, a blemish or a um, lesion from that, you address it as you go. But uh, ideally, it's to prevent them to begin with. All righty. So, our next kind of category of vaccine that we'll often vaccinate cattle against is respiratory disease. Um, and I've heard people talk about this being the alphabet soup shots because there's a lot of there's a lot of acronyms involved and it can get quite confusing very quickly. Um, but essentially, uh, if we talk about BRD, that's just bovine respiratory disease in general. Um, then there are a variety of viruses as well as bacteria involved. Um, although it's much more common to vaccinate against the viruses, uh, the viral vaccines in general uh, offer a little bit better immunity um, just because they're viral vaccines. Um, and uh, the viruses typically are what start our bovine respiratory disease complex, and then that allows the, the bacteria to get a foothold and continue that disease and make it more severe. Um, so typically we, we consider if, if we're going to vaccinate for any part of bovine respiratory disease, it'll be the viral portion of that, those uh, pathogens. Um, there are a variety of products, and this is probably the, the most confusing, um, the most number of products on the market, and can you can easily get overwhelmed trying to make a decision about your individual product. And this is where your veterinarian is super helpful on helping you kind of wade through all of the um, products that are on the market, help you find one that fits, fits your goals and what um, the animals that you're trying to vaccinate. Um, whenever you start hearing words like modified live versus killed, these are the, the class of vaccines that that's talking about. Um, and in general, uh, for show calves, you're probably going to be more 
uh, interested in using a modified live product, which will be uh, confer a little bit higher level of immunity. Um, they don't often need to be boosted, but it is not a bad idea for them, for those animals to get a second dose uh, down the line to, to build that immunity or booster that immunity. Um, however, the, the killed options are safer, especially in pregnant animals. Um, as well, they're a little bit easier to handle. The, the modified live, we have to be very careful about um, temperature control as we do on all vaccines. Uh, but then once we mix those, those uh, together, so this is a killed product and this is a modified live product that we have to mix a liquid into a powder. That's another way to tell the difference. Um, and once they're mixed, they, they need to be used quite quickly um, within hours um, to remain effective. Uh, but this is another another class. They also are combined with our next kind of category sometimes um, as far as uh, all the different bacteria or diseases that are that are included in that vaccine. So uh, um, it can we can have a lot of different pathogens in one bottle, uh, which can can simplify things, but also gives us so many choices that it does make it mu much more complicated sometimes. Um, and then obviously there's reproductive vaccines, which are only for our uh, heifer prospects. Um, we, we should not be vaccinating steers against these uh, diseases. Um, Bangs vaccine uh, or against brucella abortus, brucellosis. Um, that is a very common vaccine given to heifers between four and 12 months of age. It's also federally regulated. So a veterinarian has to give that, an accredited veterinarian has to give that vaccine. Um, and we have to apply identification in their ear. So if you ever see a, a heifer with an orange clip in her ear, similar to where this, this person's thumb is, uh, that indicates that she received a brucellosis vaccine as a calf. Um, they have these metal clips that are also just silver and that's just an ID. It's not, it does not indicate uh, brucellosis vaccination. They will also have a tattoo in their ear that looks just like this. Um, the R stands for the vaccine that we're giving, the RB51. There'll be a shield and then a number, which is the last year that that animal, the last digit of the year that that animal is vaccinated. So it'll be in the right ear between these cartilages here. Um, and if we were vaccinating them this year, it would be an RV1. Uh, and then this uh, number here is also you can be utilized as an official ID if you're trying to transport across state lines. Uh, so it is a good idea to have that in the animal's ear before you start going to shows. Alternatively, you can use an 840 tag, an RFID tag uh, that starts with the digits 840, and that is uh, also utilized as an official ID on health papers and, and things like that. Um, we also would like to get those heifers vaccinated against leptospirosis um, and Campylobacter, also known as Vibrio. These cause abortions, all three of them cause abortions in cattle, um, but they are also um, zoonotic, meaning people can contract these diseases as well. So uh, we, we want to prevent disease in, in cattle, but also kind of indirectly protecting humans um, from coming in contact with these through aborted, aborted fetuses. Um, any comments about any of that? There are a variety of other uh, vaccines on the market, and this is only just a small sample of the rest of the vaccines that you can find on the market. Um, and I, I say each of these should probably be um, evaluated on an individual basis. Um, so Moraxella or pink eye vaccine, uh, it often is included with other types of vaccines or can be um, sold alone as a single, single vaccine. Um, there are mixed reviews from a lot of people on its overall efficacy. Um, and then there's other factors that are involved as well in whether or not an animal develops pink eye. Um, so again, if you're concerned about that in your cattle, definitely talk with your veterinarian and decide if this is a viable option um, or something that should be included in your vac vaccination protocols. 
at being from Oklahoma and Kansas and Texas, we're all very aware of uh, anaplas or anaplasmosis in our our cattle, a bloodborne disease. Um, it's endemic in these areas, meaning cattle born here are almost certainly infected with it um, as a calf. And we actually kind of hope that they are so that they develop their own level of immunity. Um, cattle that we bring from other areas of the country into this, uh, into these states as adult cattle are at high risk of developing full-blown clinical anaplas. Um, and if you do uh, import, not or bring animals from other parts of the country as an adult, it's something to be very aware of and, and talk with your veterinarian about trying to um, keep those animals protected uh, from full-blown anaplasma, anaplasma disease. Anthrax is really only a problem in certain parts of the country, like the Pecos Valley of Texas, parts of the Dakotas. Um, and so if you're in an area that has that, of course, be aware, but um, typically not a problem unless you're in those regions where it is commonly found. Foot rot, there, is, there are foot rot vaccines on the market. Um, if you're having such a issue with foot rot that vaccine is put on the table as, a, as an option, um, there are other things we need to be worried about as well as far as foot health and uh, sanitation and making sure those animals aren't standing in knee deep mud um, and predisposing them to having issues with foot rot. Um, there are wart vaccines on the market, uh, which can be quite effective. Um, and obviously a wart would be a, a pretty unsightly blemish on a, on a show animal, uh, as well as potentially keep you from being able to attend a show um, since it is a communicable, um, very contagious disease sometimes. Um, and so either protecting those animals or if you have an outbreak of warts, um, sometimes just removing the wart physically um, kind of stimulates the immunity uh, in place of a vaccine, but certainly a vaccine may be, may be a good option if you've, you've had big issues with that in the past. Um, there are rabies vaccines labeled for cattle, um, but we typically do not vaccinate. But if I was gonna vaccinate any, any bovid for rabies, it might be a show animal just because of the close contact with humans. So um, just realize that there are a lot of vaccines on the market that we have, uh, particular use for in certain situations, but but don't get overwhelmed with with the myriad of of choices that are out there. Yeah, Dr. Weaver, I'd, I want to make sure we're we're staying on time, so feel free to cut me off at any point. But I, I will tell you, I have a personal uh, recommendation on the rabies side of things. Um, having eliminated multiple skunks in my barn. Um, with really high value animals uh, in there. I can say confidently that every skunk that's been eliminated in my barn has gone to the rabies test lab and all of them have been positive. And it is, if nothing else, um, a, a reassurance that the investment I've made in those animals that happen to be in the show barn and, and why do they why do they show up in the show barn skunks, right? Um, in this part of the world or other carriers of rabies, got higher activity, we got feed there. Um, generally, if you're like my barn, you got a couple of barn cats too with, with cat food outright. But um, rabies is a bit of a soapbox for me. And so I totally agree with you on, on having that. Dr. Barker, do you have anything else to add as we round out the, the vaccination part of the presentation? In the, the only thing I would add in the vaccine portion would be is in the other vaccine categories, definitely talk with your veterinarian regionally about things that may not be nationwide. Uh, for instance, pink eye foot rot, those there's vectors, there's pathogens that are more specific to different areas. There's outside of the realm of a commercial vaccine. And this is where working with your veterinarian, some of the autogenous vaccines come in great use of region, region specific for preventing those issues. So. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Um, yeah, none of my show animals were ever vaccinated for rabies growing up, but uh, if we ever have children, um, I think I'm going to have everybody vaccinated for rabies for sure. Just go down the line and everybody gets a rabies vaccine. So that's my recommendation. And then I'm uh, Dr. Weaver, we've got, oh, probably 20 minutes or so left. So I'm, I'm sorry if I've cut your time off uh, no, I, too short. I will try to, we'll try to keep it up to speed for you. I may have to rush just a little bit at the end, but I think we're, okay. we're perfectly on track. So, um, so a bit about parasite control. Um, 
parasites are certainly an issue um, in our show cattle, um, but I didn't want to if we take a whole class over parasitology in vet school, we could spend hours on this. But uh, just very briefly, some of the most common problems in cattle, um, ostratagia, or more commonly called the brown stomach worm. Uh, we've got a picture here of a abomasum, or the, the true stomach of a, of a ruminant animal, um, the acidic portion, just like you and I have an acidic stomach. Um, and that's where this, this parasite lives. Um, there's kind of two different types of disease. One of them, they bury in the uh, wall of the stomach and then all emerge at the at a later time and can make an animal very very ill um, the other type they they may just pick up parasites here and there and just like any other animal with with intestinal worms um, or gi parasites um, can really negatively influence production and gain and things that we're really trying to achieve with our with our show animals um, but this can be a, a a big detriment to those goals. Coccidia, I didn't, I don't have a picture of it, but uh, this one can also cause lots of problems. It's not ne necessarily a worm; it's a it's a microscopic parasite um, that lives in the intestinal wall. Usually causes very pronounced bloody diarrhea in cattle, um, and again can really hurt our our gain and our production in these these animals. Um, Identifying these is is very important in deciphering which which parasite we're dealing with because treatment for each is different. Um, and so again, working with your veterinarian uh, at minimum, submitting a fecal sample to them for evaluation and probably letting them examine the the animal as well to to see if there's anything else going on. Also, external parasites are also extremely common, um, and as we've got. Uh, example here of lice with the the very typical hair loss around the the head neck and shoulders as well as other parts of the the body and then mites um, up on causing a much more uh, crusty sort of skin lesion um, that can be also be very uh, itchy as well depending on the exact type of mite we're dealing with um, again treatments can be similar but depending on the exact species that we're dealing with um, treatment might be targeted or more or different. And so uh, working with your veterinarian to identify the exact parasite you're dealing with um, and potentially down to the, the species of these, each individual that we're, we're up against can guide our treatment a little better. We're gonna move on now to treatment protocols. And this is mostly gonna be about um, antibiotics. And we're gonna talk a little bit about anti-inflammatories. Um, but in general, uh, whenever we're trying to design a treatment protocol, uh, partnering veterinarians with, with our cattle owners, um, we have to ask ourselves a few, a few different questions. Mostly, what are we treating? Is, is the disease even infectious? Um, if it's not infectious, uh, antibiotics are probably not going to be very beneficial, um, and they may actually hurt our improvement um, Antibiotics are not necessarily benign. They can cause uh, GI issues um, and enough antibiotics can cause die off of rumen microflora and those animals will go off feed and, and won't recover um, because we've caused further problems, um, not necessarily that have to do with their initial problem. Uh, if it is infectious, what's the causative agent? Um, antibiotics are all effective against a subset of bacteria, but no antibiotic is good against all bacteria. So we have to choose our, our antibiotic appropriately based on what is either most likely or we've got proof that it is this, this bacteria that we're, we're up against. Um, what body systems are affected? Not all antibiotics reach all parts of the body equally. Um, that is an a area of antibiotic that we talk about um, particularly like joints, not all antibiotics penetrate joints very well or um, the central nervous system. So depending on what we're up against, uh, certain antibiotics would be better than others. Um, how severe or chronic are the clinical signs? Um, if you've got a chronic respiratory disease, no amount of antibiotics in the world is gonna make that animal better. Um, uh, similarly, if you've got a, a joint that's been infected for, for a month, there's damage that's happened that even if we could wave a magic wand and get rid of the infection, that animal's never going to 
fully recover um, at that point. So um, then there's other questions that we need to know how long should treatment last. Um, if we if we cut treatment too short, we might be back at square one. Um, or if we go too long with treatment, that's added expense, but also, again, like I said, causing other further issues um, in these animals. So the take home message from all of this is, is really working with a, a, a veterinarian and trying to either develop a initial treatment protocol, um, which we'll touch on here in a second, but um, also getting these animals to a veterinarian as quickly as possible so that uh, any treatment that can be done will have the best chance of being successful. Um, I know there's oftentimes we, we get patients in that have had three different antibiotics or, or other treatments, and it's not necessarily that those treatments were, were wrong. It's we always have a better chance of, of treating an animal successfully the earlier we're able to see it. So um, having a veterinarian at least involved as quickly as possible um, is very much advisable. So we have a relatively small list of available drugs in, in food animal medicine. Um, if you start talking about the drugs we treat horses or small animals with, the, the list gets much larger. Um, but there's still a lot of things that can be confusing and it can be daunting to pick the correct antibiotic for our situation. Um, I've just got a list of some of the most common ones here. And these are all have at least some label for use in food animal medicine. Um, some of them like Ceftiafur, Exceed, XNL, and Naxel. Um, we are somewhat limited in what we can do with those antibiotics. We, for cattle, we do have to stick with the correct uh, dose, the correct route, and the correct frequency. Um, but just because uh, a certain disease is, on the lab is not on the label does not mean we can't treat them for that. We just have to stick with the correct we can't change the dose or the route or the frequency. Um, Batril, on the other hand, um, we have to follow the label exactly. We cannot change anything about how we are using Batril off of the label. Um, that is explicitly illegal. Um, and that is because it is such a useful antibiotic in human medicine um, that if we're going to use it in food animal, we need to do so judiciously and um, so that it remains effective not only for our use in our livestock, but also in human medicine as well. There's a variety of other antibiotics that are out there that are extremely, extremely illegal to use. Um, so nitrofurazone, uh, many people are probably familiar with the, the orange, or not orange, the bright yellow paste uh, that is put on wounds, but that is not for any, not for use in any food animal um, as it can cause cancer, I believe in people. Um, chloramphenicol, which is actually uh, closely related to new floor or floor fenicol, um, but even trace amounts can cause uh, a very uh, dramatic disease in humans called aplastic anemia that can be life-threatening, um, and so it's not for use in in food animals at all. There's actually only a couple atoms difference between chloramphenicol and floor fenicol, but that's why we have have this drug at our our disposal. Vancomycin is a, is a really, we call it a big gun in human medicine. So it's not for, not for use in food animals at all. Um, and then metronidazole again is, is totally illegal for any use in food animal uh, because of uh, the potential to cause cancer if, if there were any even microscopic or uh, extremely small residues in, in uh, our animal products. There are other drugs on the market like genomycin and amikacin. Uh, these are called aminoglycosides, um, commonly used in horses, but not strictly speaking illegal in food animals. The withdrawal period is just like 18 months to two years. So there's a voluntary ban in the industry that we just don't use them because it's it would be too difficult to avoid having residues in our meat products. Um, and then uh, medicated feeds is kind of a different issue. Any, any antibiotic that is formulated to be fed to a group of animals has to have veterinary oversight um, and uh, requires that veterinarians work with the feed mixing companies as well as clients to um, come up with a, a very exact description how this is supposed to be utilized in 
our patients, um, and there's no growth promote growth promoting use of these antibiotics now in these feeds, um, only for therapeutic uses. Um, and so if you require something like this, you will definitely have to work with your veterinarian to, to uh, accomplish that, but typically used on, on much larger scale where we're having to feed um, 50 or 100 animals to treat them um, all as a group, um, not typically the individual thing that we're talking about with, with show animals. Anti-inflammatories, so we have NSAIDs like banamine and meloxicam, um, and then we have steroids like dexamethasone. There are other examples in both of these categories, um, and these are used to uh, reduce inflammation, as uh, the name implies, um, and then also banamine and meloxicam are useful for treating pain in our our food animal species. Dexamethasone does not, strictly speaking, treat pain. It only reduces inflammation, um, but it is very, very potent at that. Um, and just reducing the inflammation may make an animal more comfortable, but it does not treat pain primarily. Um, these are extremely useful. However, they don't come without side effects. Um, overuse, either giving too much of a dose, like too large of a dose, or using it for too long a period of time can really have some negative effects on on these animals. Uh, so that abomasum, that true stomach, like I was talking about earlier, the acidic portion of the GI tract, just like our stomach, um, if we give too much of any of these medications, especially if we start combining them together, uh, if you give banamine and dexamethasone at the same time for multiple days in a row, that is a way, that is a, a model for inducing in, uh, abomasal ulcers in these animals. Um, and that can be quite life-threatening, not just painful. Um, if anybody's ever had a stomach ulcer for a variety of reasons, uh, if you take too much Advil or, or ibuprofen um, you can, or Tylenol, you can potentially create the same problem in yourself. Um, kidney failure is another big one. Um, we see very large doses of particularly banamine given to small ruminants. Um, it's, there are appropriate doses for small ruminants, um, but uh, again, if you don't know what those doses are, work with your, work with your veterinarian um, because a, a large dose of, of uh, banamine can completely destroy kidneys and um, it doesn't matter if they get over whatever you're trying to treat them for, they're not going to live very much longer after that, especially in a dehydrated animal. This is a really big problem. Um, so only giving these uh, to animals that are hopefully eating and hydrated um, would, be, would be the best um, situation. And then chronic use can cause liver dysfunction, but we typically, that's, that is less commonly seen, um, but definitely can happen as well. So these treatment protocols that we've kind of been alluding to, they are based on a, a valid veterinary client patient relationship, working closely with that veterinarian. They've seen your animals, they know who you are, um, and y'all work closely together to um, both with the same goal of having healthy, healthy animals. Um, it's really nice to have written plans in place so that um, whenever something happens, you have, uh, an indication listed. So if this animal has a fever with uh, signs of respiratory disease, um, I've give this dose of this medication by this route um, and frequency. Um, and then I, in so many days, I should expect a certain response to that treatment. And if I don't see the response that I expect, if I haven't already, I need to to call that veterinarian and say, hey, I've done X, Y, and Z, and I think it's beyond that, and we need to we need to ha have you examine this animal. I don't think every dose of antibiotic needs to be administered by a veterinarian, but I, I would like to see a veterinarian at least involved in the conversation. Um, there's a lot that goes into the making choices about the antibiotics that we're using, um, and who better than someone who's been trained uh, extensively over the use of those those drugs so that we're we're using them correctly. Um, and then extra label drug use. So this is defined as the use of any drug in a manner that's not explicitly on its label. That doesn't mean it's illegal. There are certain um, criteria that if you if you meet those criteria, um, 
you can use a drug that's not in accordance with its label, but does meet conditions set forth by certain laws that we have, particularly this Animal Medical Drug Use Clarification Act. Um, your veterinarian will, will know how to, to navigate those for you and uh, help you uh, make those choices. Also, any extra label drug use requires a veterinary client patient relationship. If you don't have that, you cannot legally use a drug off label. Um, also, there are other things like extended withdrawal periods that are needed, which we'll talk about here in just a second. So Dr. Barker, when we're talking about these treatment plans and VCPRs, and I think leaving this slide up makes a lot of sense, Dr. Weaver, to be honest with you with this part of the conversation. Um, we are quickly approaching, we're, we're, lots of kids have, uh, have had county this week, right? Um, premium sales tonight, looking to, to head to Oklahoma Youth Expo in, in just a few days. Um, this is where I used to get a lot of questions when I was in practice about what medications can I give? So how do you have those, what's the best way to have those conversations with your veterinarian when it comes to treatment plans and in particular looking at residue avoidance? Uh, the biggest thing is to be in contact with the veterinarian the closer you get to these, if not routinely, uh, for multiple reasons. One is you're not the only one dealing with a respiratory case or a foot rod or other things. And we've potentially seen three, four, five, 10 of the same thing in that area. And we already know what's working or what's been effective, what hasn't been effective. Uh, you'll see certain antibiotics will be more effective one year than they are another. And hopefully we've already established that so we can start that treatment early and get things under control more quickly by using the, the proper antibiotic initially. Uh, the other thing would be route of administration when you're talking about uh, withdrawal times or tissue damage is to use them how they are approved. That's how the withdrawal times were established and any alteration in route of administration changes that withdrawal time. And that's probably the number one thing this time of year coming into these terminal shows is if it's an IV administration and you've got a four day withdrawal and you choose to use it orally, it may be 15 days, 18 days. You may have totally offset uh, and then you're in a terminal show and you get called for a drug residue and you've voided all your, all your hard work for the past year. So I, I think with that is proper treatment early in the disease process and when you're coming up on these shows is being very in tune with withdrawal times and route of administration. So uh, we've been talking a lot about withdrawal time. So what is that exactly? Um, it's the period of time that is required for a drug uh, to fall below a tolerance after it is administered um, in the tissues that we're going to be eating. Um, all these animals are food animals there after all. Um, but the way that it's usually thought of is the amount of time after the last dose of a drug is given until an animal can be harvested for human consumption. That doesn't necessarily mean there's no drug. It just means there's only very uh, small, minute amounts left. Um, a, there's a tolerance developed for each drug, and each drug has a different tolerance. Um, and that's based on uh, a lot of scientific data, which has uh, allowed us to come up with a accepted daily intake um, that would result in no adverse effects over a human lifetime. So if you ate um, a piece of steak that had that uh, tolerance level in it every day for the rest of your life, um, we've shown that that would not cause or, uh, any, any harm. However, some drugs have zero tolerance um, because they have no safe level of human consumption. Some of those drugs are ones that we cannot use at all, um, but uh, the other time a zero tolerance comes into play is when we have extra label drug use. So, um, that's also why we have to have an extended extended withdrawal because um, not only is the tolerance small, it's if, if there's any detectable level of that drug, it is therefore a violation. And zero is getting smaller all the time. Our detection levels are getting better every year. Um, and so um, just because we couldn't detect it before doesn't mean we won't in next year, five or 10 years from now. 
Um, and then drug testing it shows is often zero tolerance for a wide range of drugs. Um, so even if you follow the label exactly, um, you may be in violation of that show's policy as far as what drugs are allowed, um, specifically certain anti-inflammatories um, because they're seen as performance enhancing, if you will. Yeah, I think that that's really one of the big take home points of the, of the discussion today is, is that tolerance and, and you need to know your show rules and you need to have a discussion with your veterinarian about what what levels are are acceptable and in most cases at most of our major events particularly when it comes to anti-inflammatories again we're talking flu nixon which is banamine we're talking dex uh it's a zero tolerance and so you don't want to have worked as you said you don't want to work all year long or, or longer than that and then get that purple banner and then be disqualified because you have a have a residue, regardless of of the level. Because again, it's often uh, in many cases zero tolerance. Period. If we have a, do we have enough time to go through the last few slides, Dr. Biggs? I think if we can just breeze through them, maybe just mention yep. not the not an in depth description, yep. but you know, bringing up common diseases and then encouraging folks as we've done today to. To talk to their veterinarian about if we have a if we have pneumonia in calves, what, what do we do next? That kind of yep. thing. And so, on that point, pneumonia in cattle, bovine respiratory disease or BRD, there's a lot of different terminology get, that gets thrown around. Shipping fever, uh, interstitial pneumonia, either. Uh, it used to be a typical interstitial pneumonia, but now we're moving more towards acute interstitial pneumonia anyway. Um, but all of these terms can be applied to the same case potentially, um, or at least be differentials. Um, some of them are infectious causes that, that cause, and vast majority of the time it is, but there are also other causes of pneumonia or respiratory disease in cattle. So in those instances, even though you've treated with an antibiotic, that those are probably not going to resolve um, and need further intervention uh, as well. Bloat is an extremely common uh, disease in show cattle. Uh, the normal rumen has three layers with gas, and if it accumulates too much gas, that rumen will actually put a lot of pressure on the diaphragm, and they will suffocate uh, in a short amount of time. And so this is one of the few cases that is a true medical emergency. If it's 2 a.m. and you find that you have a bloated animal, a truly bloated animal, that requires attention now, um, either by yourself or, or a trained personnel. Um, but we strongly recommend getting them to a veterinarian as quickly as possible uh, because it could be either free gas, as in this image, a big pocket of air that all we have to do is pass a tube and uh, relieve it in a matter of seconds, or frothy, which is shown here. We've got a good demonstration with this uh, classic abdominal distension here on the left side, especially up high. Um, and then in this animal, we passed a tube and got some froth out, which was trapping all that gas, not allowing it to pass. So we gave a, a therabloat, a drug that will um, break up all that froth and turn it into a pocket of air and allowed that animal to to rest for about 30 or 45 minutes and she was able to pass all that gas herself and not suffocate. Um, and so this may be something you, you have a few bottles of at home um, with instructions from your veterinarian how to use if needed. Um, but again, at least alerting a veterinarian as quickly as possible that you've got one of these cases um, because it can, an animal can die in less than an hour uh, sometimes once we find them. Not all cases of bloat are uh, due to that, this animal ended up having to have surgery um, for a similar cause. So don't just think just because their abdomen is distended uh, that they are bloated. Um, sometimes it's it's a little more complicated than that. Um, lameness is probably the other more, most common thing that we see in show cattle. In cattle in general, it's almost entirely associated with the foot, either sole ulcers, white line disease leading to sole abscesses, or foot rot or hairy heel were other infectious causes of, of lameness. Um, and if we, we recognize these things early, we can often treat them and, and do just fine. Um, however, if they're allowed to persist too long, we get into much bigger issues. So this is a classic case of foot rot here, uh, erosion in between the toes with swelling 
symmetrical side to side. Um, and this one's already started to heal. Actually, you can see some good granulation tissue there. Uh, but this is the only case of lameness that is consistently and effectively treated with an injection of antibiotics. Um, if you try to treat a case of lameness with an injection of antibiotics and they are not better in a matter of days, um, then you need to seek attention very quickly. This is looks similar, uh, but in fact, I actually pulled a little foreign body from between the toes. And best I can tell, it's a, a chicken femur um, that got stuck between there. But I've pulled, I've pulled uh, rocks the size of golf balls between toes of cattle, and they immediately become sound. So definitely checking between there um, and not just giving an injection, because obviously an injection is not going to fix a rock stuck between the toes. Um, digital dermatitis or hairy heel wart very painful, very contagious, which is the other big problem. And it can quickly spread through a, a show barn um, and your calves if you bring it home on one of your, one of your animals. Uh, sole abscesses and ulcers, um, which require us to work on the foot, not just injections. Less common in show cattle, but certainly if they are present, need to be addressed. But this is probably one of our most common causes of lameness in show cattle. Um, effusion of the joints, either due to poor conformation, if they're too straight on their hocks, or um, if they're pushed too hard on grain and have abnormal uh, levels of growth or um, issues with their, with their um, cartilage in their joints, they can have, have issues with this. Um, I've had clients want me to drain this fluid because they think they'll, those animals will become sound and they might for a very short amount of time, but that fluid's going to come right back. Um, and every time we stick a needle into it, we risk causing an infection that is very difficult to treat once it gets into a joint. So um, these are some of the most challenging cases we see, unfortunately, um, because it seems simple, but it, it really is not. Um, and we're up against factors that are beyond our control often. Um, well, I appreciate everyone being attentive during this, and I hope everybody gets something out of it. This is, uh, I took this picture uh, riding my mare, uh, and that's an Oklahoma sunset in the background, special place in my heart for those Oklahoma sunsets. So, Thank you, Dr. Weaver. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'll have you bring your, stop your share, if you will. We'll take a few questions. Um, Dr. Parker, while we, while we wait for a couple of questions, do you have any kind of closing comments, recommendations for um, our, our show exhibitors, show families? Uh, we've got lots of extension educators on the line with us today. Uh, what, what are our take homes from today? Uh, as Dr. Weaver had mentioned, nutrition is number one. Uh, if your nutrition is out of balance, so is everything else. You can vaccinate for anything you wish to, and you're not going to get proper immunization without just the foundation of good nutrition and macro, micro mineral supplementation. So above all that would be foremost. Again, back to talking to the breeder that you purchased from, know where they are and putting them on feed. Don't rush them into a feed change. Do that slow, gradual. Don't offset the rumen microbes and start a problem in that microflora early. If they do become ill and require treatment, I'm a big, big advocate for um, probiotics and keeping them on probiotics and enhancing those Roman microbes while you are offsetting them by giving antibiotics. Um, vaccinate, know what you're vaccinating for, know that you're doing it properly, use the proper antibiotics properly and timely uh, and try to prevent those chronic diseases and pay very close attention to your withdrawal times this time of year, as well as lice. I mean, lice sneak up on everybody this yeah. time of year. And by the time you know you've got a lice problem, it's too late. Uh, so, so be ahead of that. Keep them where they can't rub on post. You know, a lot of times we would set up hot wires to keep them off corners, off of feed bunks, uh, as well as use a, a water water-based uh, parasite, par excuse me, water-based lice product because sometimes the oil will burn some of your hair off. Uh, you know, they all, they all respond to it differently, but prevention in all cases, whether it's bacterial, viral, or parasite is always the preferred route to go instead of, instead of treatment, so. Dr. Barker, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, 
So if uh, just a family's on here that consistently shows maybe five, six calves a year, you know, there's always a time you're, you're going to have a problem with one of those and may not always come on a day where it's easy to get a hold of a veterinarian. If there were a few products on a treatment side that you would recommend a family have on hand uh, to, to cover a, a wide variety of things, what would you, all the things we talked about, what would you recommend a family have on hand? Hopefully, Doctor, we will agree with this. Um, I I like safety of fear as a first draw in show animals as long as it's used properly, um, because you're highly unlikely with, for instance, Naxil to get any kind of lesion uh, used properly and timely. A lot of times, it's going to offset any where some of your subcuticular or oil based may create small lesions. That's, that's one I like to have on hand and like to have available. Um, you know, a lot of times, first thing people will grab is a tetracycline, which can be very irritative uh, and create swelling and lesions. And then you're not only still yet trying to heal an animal, get an animal well, but then you're, you've got a post-treatment lesion that you've got to worry about or blemish that you've got to uh, address as well, so. Thank you. Dr. Weaver, do you have anything anything to add to that um, as far as what, as a show family, um, what, you know, I think it's easy, like, well, I've got that in, in the show box, or, or, or what, what kind of is the emergency go-to things that need to be in the show box when we head, head to the show? Um, I really like having, so, like I brought up with the bloat, I think having a dose of paloxylene or therabloat in there. Um, or several bottles, especially if you've got an animal that you know bloats. Um, a lot of show calves uh, have recurrent issues with bloat. Um, and the last thing you want to be is uh, stuck somewhere without the ability to uh, to deal with that. Um, and then not there's not a whole lot of other things that I would say are are absolutely necessary um but i do like the the recommendation of of naxel for the or safety for your products like you said um i think that's a, a very valid option um and people just need to be aware of um we do have to be sure we're using it appropriately um, because it is one of the ones that is more regulated as far as pr appropriate dose and things like that yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've heard time and time again throughout this Rancher series, anytime we're talking about animal health, regardless of whether it's uh, commercial or show or, or, or otherwise, uh, we need to be reading those labels, right? And, um, of course, you've got a lot of veterinarians on the, on the screen <clears throat> today. Uh, can't overemphasize that, that relationship. So uh, I want to wrap up one last question. We did have a question about back to that rabies vaccine and uh, – um, Go ahead, Dr. Parker. Just one thing to add to Dr. Weaver's uh, bloat on that. I, if I can stress one thing about bloat is I highly, highly recommend against bottle drenching with mineral oil. If you do not have a tube passed and in the stomach, just bypass using mineral oil altogether. It's a horrible death to watch and there's nothing you can do to stop it if you get that down trachea. Um, I would also encourage you to carry, they've got the commercially available trocars, the red trocars. It does not hurt to have one of those handy in case you can't get the bloat off and we can deal with the uh, lesion created after you save one. Uh, but those are, those are two things I would add on bloat. For sure. For sure. And, and um, you know, that's, you're absolutely right. Mineral oil is, um, is useful, but only when appropriately administered and uh, is not to be really, that's not a first time time go of things. And so we have lots of youth exhibitors on, on with us and that will watch these. Uh, we need to be need to be aware of that. And, and again, visit with your veterinarian about what, what the best options are for, for picks as far as medications and, and your skill level too. 
Mm -hmm. So with that, um, we did have one question back to the rabies as far as when should that be administered. Most of those rabies vaccines, you need, again, back to read the label. Uh, most of those rabies vaccines are the ones that are labeled for bovine uh, administration are going to be at a three months of age or older. It's a two cc dose. But again, double check that label before you administer it. And then it's an annual revac on that. Um, 12 months after the initial administration. So there's a couple of things, Dr. Henley, you've hung with us all, all this time. I hope San Antonio uh, was enjoyable last week. I saw that the judging team did well. Do you have any closing remarks for us today? No, I, I don't. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion mm -hmm. and thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, I, I'm, I apologize to our attendees. Um, I, I have a tendency to go a little bit over time, but any additional questions, you're welcome to send those to Dr. Lawman and I will be happy to address those and get those to our panelists if, if we can't handle them ourselves. In final closing, uh, as I mentioned before, this is, I think, number 42 of the Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series. We've done this every week uh, for, for 42 weeks now. Uh, those recordings are available at beef.okstate.edu if you're looking for, looking for some resources, educational options, particularly for our educators uh, on the line today. Those are a great library to get things started or if you're have a particular question about something you're wanting to implement into your herd. We are gonna take a break. Uh, on the Ranchers series. Uh, I think uh, there are many that have um, had enough virtual uh, this, this past year with the pandemic. So, but we will be back. We promise we'll be back as, uh, as we approach summer for probably a quarter, uh, a quarterly seminar, um, a series, uh, probably in, in mid to late summer. So be looking for that. Uh, we will be sending you notices on your email for those of you all obviously if you're here today you registered so uh, keep keep us in mind for that and you can always check that beef.okstate.edu or you can send a uh, note to any of our extension team we'll be happy to help you as always again we do we are part of the oklahoma cooperative extension service we have a presence in all 77 counties so we're here to be a resource for you uh, whether at the county level or the state level and we have great partnerships uh, to help get get our producers in the area, regardless of whether you're commercial or show, uh, we want to be able to, to assist you if you have a need. So with that, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Weaver from Manhattan, Kansas. We appreciate that. Dr. Barker, uh, we appreciate all, all you and your family do for the show industry here in Oklahoma. And um, thanks for taking the time. I know you're super busy. So uh, again, right. gentlemen, Thank you so much, and um, we will see, see you all again next in the Rancher Series uh, sometime this summer. Stay tuned. All right. Thank you.